thank you, thank you. Great intro. Um, I was coming here before I was going to go to the US, and then work set for me to go to the US, so I was already locked in here oh. first. So this was my priority this week. Um, now, one thing, forget that I'm Lewis, OK? Just forget that I'm Lewis, otherwise this talk's not going to work. But we'll start. Warning. The following awesome presentation contains slides with flashing images for storytelling purposes. Any events described may or may not be fictional. Hey, you must be new to this co-working space. Let me introduce myself via the form of a musical number. I'm just Ozzy, engineering skills X10. Is it my life to write YAML again and again and again and again? <laughs> People love me here, partially because I'm so great at singing in public places while others are trying to work. Um, but with my 10x ability, there's no we works in this uh, office today. It's an Aussie work kind of space. I work for Big Corp, and I'm kind of a big deal there. But I'm sure you already knew that. Big Corp sent me to KCD Guadalajara last year. I'm still wearing the t-shirt today. If you're wondering about what that smell is, it's because I haven't washed this t-shirt yet. There have been no security incidents since I've been back, and I think this t-shirt is giving me good luck. Wait, what? That's not the smell. It must be my lunch. Um, I've been microwaving some fish. I get so many compliments here, like, Ozzy, are you microwaving fish again? And... Lleva toda la semana oliendo horrible. What's that? You're just getting into Kubernetes too. Let me show you the perfect cluster that I made single-handedly. This is Aussie's production cluster. We already have uh, Big Corp running production workloads. I don't know what everyone's going on about. Kubernetes isn't that hard. I've moved all of our Big Corp microservices into containers. Lift and shift, baby. Uh, these are run as pods, and you can see them as an app in the bottom right of a cluster. We've scaled to meet their needs with a HPA and all this from a two-day conference, a technical masterpiece. Everyone is in this co-working space is so lucky to have me here today. I am the perfect engineer. Now, I need to go and talk with management. I deserve a huge promotion. You wait here. I'm going to go and stand in the most important area in this room and take this call. I'll be right back. Hi, I'm Nova. I'm here in this co-working space today, too, and ugh, I'm really sick of that Aussie guy walking around here like he owns the place. He needs to be brought down to earth, am I right? And I think I'm the one to do the job. You see, I look pretty friendly, and I really am a deeply kind person. Like, I buy the most expensive birthday gifts for my friends. With the money that I make stealing data from co-working spaces like this one, uh, the people around here should really be more careful. So basically, I hang out here, I pretend to work, and watch people. And sometimes I see someone who gets really excited and leaves their desk with their computer unlocked. I have this tool called a rubber ducky. It looks like an innocent USB flash drive, but to the computer, it's a keyboard typing at superhuman speeds. So I'm going to plug it into Ozzy's computer and cause some trouble. I'll tell you more about exactly what I'm doing with the rubber ducky later, but meanwhile, let's do something to mess with them in the short term. I'm going to apply a YAML to run my workload on his cluster, and then I'm going to take away his cluster admin access so he can't easily stop my running application. Now, let's pull up my app in his browser. Okay, now I'll lock his computer. Oh my God, look at his lock screen. <laughs> This guy is something else. Okay, I got my rubber ducky. I could need to get back to my desk before someone sees me. So, 
so management said they're going to call me back later. Um, apparently, they're busy right now. But, um, right, let's have a look. Um, Nova rules, Ozzy draws. First of all, that's not true. The pillow was already wet before I went to sleep. And uh, why is that URL pointing to BigCorp? Oh, no. Nova has somehow accessed my new cluster. Well, I know Nova, or, well, no of them. Some fool got pwned um, by Nova the other day. It was a talk of a co-working space. Apparently, Nova got some pictures of him, and they transferred Bitcoin money to Nova's wallet to stop her sharing those pictures. But apparently, Nova's asking for more money. There was an investigation here to find out who Nova is, but no one could find anyone wearing a dark hoodie and an anonymous mask. I have to hurry up and delete the site before anyone sees it. Right. Shoot, I'm getting an error. I can't delete their workload. The error message looks like my RBAC has changed. Raw base access control, or RBAC, is used to define what a user or service can or can't do on a cluster. That's super weird. I gave myself most privileges so that I could run this cluster. What's changed? Luckily, I have an offline config file on the cluster admin on my USB uh, key, which I have in my wallet alongside a photo of myself. Now, let's plug that in, switch the cube config file. Great, I have cluster admin access again by using the admin profile. I'll use this profile to make changes to the cluster to harden it. Now, hardening is where we make our Kubernetes cluster more secure, making it harder for people to attack. I should be careful about managing this admin account, though. We might need to access this in a break glass emergency, but we should have processes in place to make sure we know who can access it and when. Maybe having it in my wallet isn't the best idea. We could use a secrets manager to store this securely, but equally, having the offline in a literal safe making it physically secure could be a good option too. So I'm still using the admin account. I'm able to remove Nova's website, but if Nova has his sights on me, I'd better try harder. Let's update my RBAC so instead of having most privilege, I have least privilege when I connect to the cluster with my Aussie account, enough to do the work that I'm supposed to do and nothing more. But thinking about it, the API shouldn't be available to everyone on the public internet. We already have strong security in place to ensure who can access the internal networks of our cluster via our cloud provider. So using my cloud provider, I can, I'll put my cube API into a private network so randoms can no longer access it, but big people, sorry, but people in big corps uh, can still interact if needed. This is more secure, but I've hit a problem. How do I manage what's running in my cluster if I don't have direct access to cube API? I can only view the cluster now with my Aussie account. How do I create, apply, delete, or patch my workloads? I've heard about this thing called GitOps. It's like infrastructure as code, but for my cluster. I can put all my YAML into a Git repo, and then I can use GitOps to monitor that repo for any changes to the cluster configuration. I learned about CNCF GitOps tools like Argo CD, Flux, and Carvel Cap Controller that can help me achieve this. Then the GitOps tool will be the, own, will be the one to interact with the Cube API to deploy all the company's workloads. This all happens within the private network. But how does this help us here? Well, instead of a cluster having configuration set in, the cluster can go out and get, uh, get check for Git repo. Instead of giving away a key to the cluster to be able to run any workloads, I can give the GitOps tool access to the Git repo and let that update the cluster via the Cube API. Then I just need to secure the Git repo instead of a Cube API being the threat boundary. And that then becomes a Git repo. I also learned recently about Kubescape. Uh, Kubescape is a CLI tool that scans clusters, YAML files, and Helm charts detecting misconfigurations. I'm going to look into these results now to see if there's anything else I can change in my cluster. I wonder what's been going on over there. I've been watching my Big Corp website in my browser, and sadly, he's taken it down. Bummer. So, remember I used the innocent-looking rubber ducky hot plug to interact with Ozzy's computer? Well, let me tell you what I did exactly. First, I made a copy of his cube config file, so now I know the IP address of the cluster that he won't stop talking about. Actually, since I have this IP address, maybe I can put my website back up if this, QP API, if this Cube API server is still public. So let me take a look. So since I know this IP address of Ozzy's cluster, I can use this software called InMap to scan the ports and, ah, this tells me he made the Cube API server private. 
oh well, there's still a lot of things that I can and I will do. So back to the matter at hand, with the rubber ducky, I got that IP address to Ozzy's cluster and Ozzy's private SSH key. Now I have his identity. I also got the SSH config file, so I know where Ozzy's private SSH key can be used. And I took the git config files. It shows me all of the URLs to all of the git repositories that Ozzy's contributed to lately. So with this information, I can cause some real trouble by making git commits as Ozzy. <laughs> Nice, it's a C CFO calling me. Uh, luckily, no one saw Nova's website. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be taking this call right now about my huge promotion. All right, how am I gonna spend all this money? Well, think of all the fish I could microwave. But, all right, <laughs> Ozzy speaking. Yes, yes, no, N no. What? That must be a mistake. Uh, let me look into it. Yeah, call you back, love you, bye. Um, the call wasn't about promotion. Um, apparently, Big Corp is losing money on each sale on our website. Instead of selling our product for $100, we're selling it for something around $15. It costs us $40 to make the product, so we're uh, losing money right now. I linked our sales to a spreadsheet for the finance team, so let's check that out. I see that instead of around $100 per sale, everything is $13.37. Um, what kind of idiotic Rookie, liability coworker of mine changed the price of our product. Let me check the Git commits for the payment service. Oh, wait, it, it was me. I didn't change that code. I've been here all this time. Uh, you've seen that. Here is my commit code that sets the value to $13.37. Someone must have my identity. Right, let me just revert the uh, Git commits. If only I could remember how to revert a git commit. <laughs> um, let me check chat GPT for one moment. Uh, great, that looks like how I do it. That looks okay, right? Nope. C can you be quiet? There's super serious work going on here and you're like on some messaging app, like come on. I'm so sorry about that. I feel just awful for causing you any inconvenience. Yeah, you should, right, wait. Wait, someone just committed as me again, and the price is back to 13 and 30. Oh. How did I set up my Git account? I made sure I was secure. I used a private key that's only on my machine. A private key is better than a password, but how has someone got access to my private key? I guess I have to revoke my SSH key to stop any further commits. So let's revert the commit, but this time I'm going to sign this commit with Git sign, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment, but now let's check the log, and that looks all good. So another way to sign commits is by using a GPG key. It provides a way for me to manage and rotate keys, and I can store it on a YubiKey rather than having it on my laptop. But this time I signed this Git commit uh, by using Git sign. So using Git sign, it provides a certificate to sign a Git commit when I verify myself with OAuth, so using Google, for example. This is then stored on SIGStore, so that commit can be verified against my identity. Now let's check the spreadsheet. Back to $100, and we're good again. <laughs> it must be five o'clock somewhere right now. Right, this shows how important Git is to us. Not just my Git commits, but access to Git in general. If someone has my password, they could add a random key and commit as me again. I'll also set up multi-factor authentication. That way, to gain access to the repo, people will need to know my username, my password, and have access to my MFA device. I should have set this up long ago, but I guess I was too busy thinking how good I was. Wait, what? Back to me already? Ozzy wishes. I'm three steps ahead. Ozzy's about to notice that his cluster is running some unknown container image for his message queue instead of the company approved one. Why is my cluster running some unknown container image for the message queue instead of a company approved one? Um, that's weird. Our messaging seems to be working just fine. There have been no health status alerts. This must have come from another commit earlier on. It looks like an image is being pulled from an unknown registry off the public internet. We pull our images from a registry we own with our cloud provider. Why would we pull a random image? Let's describe the message queue. 
looks like the image name is Nova Images, generic message queue app 1337. Nova, um, let's see what this message queue container is running. I can see that data is being sent to an unfamiliar address. I don't recognize that address at all. That's not a big corp IP. Oh no, Nova's nefarious message queue app is also sending information outside of a cluster. This can't be good. Why would it need to send information out of, to the internet? I'll add Kubernetes network policies in place to ensure that the message queue doesn't have egress access. The message queue app should be taking requests from our website and passing it to our database app inside the cluster. There is no reason any part of the message queue should be sending data out of the cluster. So while Ozzy's been distracted with prank websites and its product prices changing, I've been doing my real money-making attacks. This whole time, the company message queue has been running my image, my message queue app, instead of the company approved app. So because of that, I'm capturing all of the data that's being moved through the message queue. And I am going to sell it for big money. Oh, but wait, the information just stopped being sent. Ugh. Ozzy must have put a Kubernetes network policy in place. As much as I hate to admit it, Ozzy's getting better at Kubernetes security. Lucky for me that Ozzy didn't notice the other container that I put into its cluster. I still have one big trick up my sleeve. All right, let's fix this message queue. I'll restore big court message queue by reverting the git commit that changed it to run Nova's application. And I've already set up networking policies. I've clearly defined which apps in my system are allowed access to egress, not the message queue app. But I can do better than that. Let's take a step back and look at our cluster again. Our cluster is an open network once inside the cluster. What if someone is inside our cluster? Could they intercept network calls between parts? It'd be good to have encryption set up, like how HTTPS is used to prevent person in the middle attacks within a co-working space. My cluster is like a co-working space for our apps. What happens if one of the apps starts in intercepting internal network requests? I'll add a service mesh like Istio, Linkerd, Kuma, or Cilium. A service mesh is used to set up the network inside of our cluster, and it has some additional features that we didn't have before. We can encrypt all traffic between parts so that internal traffic can't be intercepted. This is what people call mutual TLS or MTLS. A service mesh could also offer authentication, providing uh, identity between services, automatic certificate management, fine-grained network policies, and auditing and monitoring. But what about our, our workloads coming into the cluster? If someone can access a Cube API, they can apply whatever YAML they like. Then our cluster will run it. That's what Nova did. Let's see about using a cluster-level policy tool like Canovo, OPA, or Pepper by Defense Unicorns to put an emission controller in place to make sure our workload meets our requirements. Then we'll add a rule that any image run in a cluster must come from BigCorp's internal registry. This prevents images, unknown images from being run in the cluster. Done. I'm feeling great. Uh, but wait, um, the policy that I just added notified me that there's a problem. The policy fails for another image being used in the cluster. Another image is coming from a registry from outside of Big Corp. What image is failing? Nova images, generic build up, 1337. No! Nova! So when I was still able to commit as Ozzy into Ozzy's Git repo, Back before he set up multi-factor authentication, I started running my own container that was disguised to look like Ozzy's company's build service. So it's a common rookie mistake for orgs to make to have their build services with extra privileges, and it's a mistake that I now intend to exploit. So isol Ozzy isolated his build service in the CI-CD namespace of his cluster. Uh, let me show you. Here's the build service in the CI-CD namespace. So Ozzy put measures in place to isolate the CI-CD namespace from others, thinking that will protect him. But it won't. So from this privileged running build service container, I will use a tool called NSEnter to connect to a different Linux namespace on the host machine. And now I'll connect to the host process on the node. And that gives me 
a little extra privilege to gain access to the entire machine as roots. And now I can see everything. <laughs> Back to Nova Images, generic build app, 1337. Wait, 1337 is a hacker term for elite, as in elite. Nova's making me look a right noob right now. Right, let's look at what's being run. Not only is Nova running an unknown image, Nova has given a number of privileges to that container, including the process namespace of a host machine. But thinking about it, if you run a container with privileges, I'm pretty sure you'd be able to move laterally onto the machine running the containers. In that case, I'm not in a great position right now. Right, let's update our runtime policies to prevent this kind of profile from being used nefariously. Using a runtime security tool like eBPF, um, so Falco or Cubalmer, I can monitor all communications happening on the kernel and enforce runtime policies that I create. EBPF is a technology that allows code to run in the Linux kernel without changing the kernel source code or loading kernel modules. EBPF has a lot of the same features as Service Mesh, but for the kernel. It gives us lots of power, but as we know, with great power comes great, great responsibility. The kernel is outside of a Kubernetes cluster, but I could track what's going on inside the cluster from a kernel level. And it's not just a cluster, it'd be everything on the machine. So here I am, I have ac access to Ozzy's entire machine as root. So let's see first if I can listen in on any of the traffic going across the network. Ah, oh, the traffic's all encrypted, drat. Ozzy must have preemptively added service mesh. Dang, he's good and good. With eBPF, I can track what's going on in Aussie's cluster at the kernel level. And not just Aussie's cluster, it's everything on Aussie's entire machine. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna use this eBPF-based tool called Boopkit, which, as a side note, Boopkit was created by Chris Nova, a cloud-native security researcher, wonderful human, and friend. She inspired my name, but she used her hacking skills for good not for evil like me. So, right, I'm gonna use Boopkit so that I can manipulate Ozzy's running kernel. The first thing I'll do is to create a backdoor so I can get back here easily at any time without having to break out of a container again. Next, I wanna use Boopkit to see the system calls on Ozzy's Kubernetes node. Perhaps there's some data here I can sell or hold for ransom, but Ozzy's getting good at this security stuff, so I'm gonna go old school and leave my calling card. A fork bomb. So if I lose access to this cluster, the process will get started and Big Corp will pay. So fork bomb is a bash function that gets executed recursively. It's a denial of service attack where the process continually repeats itself and depletes system resources. This is what you get for microwaving fish, Ozzy! Wait, what? It didn't work? Oh no, I just lost access to the cluster. Ah, uh, I didn't have time to set up my fork bomb. Ah, uh, no! Oh, oh, no, no, no! Oh, looks like I'm completely shut out. Dang it! Ah. Uh, are you okay, Ruth? It's, it's a bad day. Why, what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, tell me about it. All right, okay, so here's what happened. I looked to add Falco onto the node, but noticed that something didn't look right. It felt like someone was already there and looking to modify something. I don't know, it was, it's over my head. So I alerted Big Corp Security, and we put plans together to quarantine the cluster. Uh, the engineering team provisioned a brand new cluster at the same time. So this new cluster is built now uh, with everything we've put in place over the last 30 minutes. We've now directed all customer traffic to the new cluster. Uh, we can use forensics on the old cluster to figure out how far Nova got. The best part is we have a brand new cluster with hardened security. Ooh, ooh, may I tell them the features of your new cluster? Uh, sure, but how do you know about my cluster? Don't, don't worry about it. I, I won't. No reason, yeah. yeah. 
So first of all, in the new Heart Hardens cluster, the Cube API isn't public, so it can only be accessed from within BigCore. Next up, Ozzy implemented least privilege access control. So this has one heavily guarded privileged accounts, which is only to be used in emergency situations, and regular users are view only. You may be asking yourself, if regular users are view only, how do they make any changes? And that is by implementing GitOps. So the GitOps tool is the thing that's interacting with the Cube API. This moves the threat boundary out to the Git repo. So instead of humans reaching into the cluster to interact with Cube API, the Git, GitOps tool is in the cluster, interacting with Cube API, and pulling outside of the cluster from the Git repo. Next, there's multi-factor authentication set up on that Git repo. Since it's the threat boundary, we need to take it very seriously. And then um, Ozzy put into place Kubernetes network policies. In the story, he put one in place to prevent me from being able to send data outside of the cluster, but network policies can be used to restrict all kinds of network access. Then Ozzy put in a service mesh. Specifically, we talked about service mesh in the context of MTLS or mutual TLS, which authenticates applications to one another and it also encrypts network traffic. Then Ozzy added a cluster level policy. These are often called mission controller policies like OPA or Kiverno. Um, Ozzy used this to make policy at the Kubernetes API level. So specifically, Ozzy made a policy that prevents um, any image from being pulled that's coming from outside of the cluster. Only images from the company's internal registry can be run. But again, the sky's the limit as far as it comes as far as it is with admission controller policies. And then finally, Ozzy set up runtime policy at the kernel level with eBPF using tools like Falco, which is an alerting tool, and CubeArmor, which can actually do enforcement at the, at the kernel level. And so Ozzy made some rules about uh, what happens at the Linux kernel, what policies, some policy around what's allowed to happen there. So this was my cluster at the beginning. Uh, looking back on it, <laughs> I feel a bit embarrassed about uh, I thought it, how good it was. But equally, I didn't know now what, I, what I've learned in the last 30 minutes. This is closer to what a hardened cluster should look like, although there is still room for improvement. I know this looks intense, but when we break it down, it all makes sense. Think about it. I finally understand what they mean by onion layer security. It's not about having a single layer or peeling that layer and crying myself off to sleep at 5 p.m. each day. It's about having strength in depth, having lots of layers of security to prevent lots of different attacks. I think I messed up the bow, but um, yeah. So um, just a quick one. So I was an Aussie, I am. Too sticky. <laughs> Lewis. Hey, Lewis. Yeah. <laughs> Lewis, hey. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, you might remember me from such talks as this one. Um, when I'm not being overly dramatic, I work for a company called ChainGuard. At ChainGuard, uh, we're rebuilding container images from the ground up. We've built our own undistro called Wolfie. Um, yeah, and we like to think of ourselves as the safe source for open source. Um, also, I run uh, KCD UK. I'm one of the organizers there. So I just want to give out a shout out to the organizers here today, the volunteers. Right now, it's the hardest point. <laughs> but um, if I see you anywhere near a bar, please come find me. I owe you several drinks. Um, and yes, thank you ever so much for putting this on. But now, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce you to the star of the show, the amazing creative mind who put all the ideas into these beautiful slides. Yes. Thank you. My name is Whitney Lee. As uh, Pedro said, I host a lot of shows. If you'd have told me when I was younger I was going to be a talk show host and a streamer at 44 years old, I wouldn't have believed you. But um, so three shows come to mind. I host, I'm a, a CNCF ambassador and I'm one of the hosts of Cloud Native Live on the Cloud Native channel. I, um, I have 
a light board in my home, so I have a show called Enlightening, where I have guests come on from CNCF projects. They teach me about their tool. They're not allowed to use any slides or coding demos. They have to do it with their bodies and mouths. That sounded obscene somehow. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then I'm behind the light board and I draw it out as I learn. So I ask a lot of questions. I don't know anything about the tech going into it. And then I really have to get the ideas clear so I can write them on the board. And then the final show I do is my favorite one. It's called You Choose. It's a choose your own adventure through the CNCF landscape. And um, so we break down the CNCF landscape into lots of system design choices. And then for each system design choice, we have a guest come on to represent that choice. And they get five minutes to talk about their CNCF project. No more, because we just want a simple high level overview. We don't want to dig into the latest little features, because presumably the audience doesn't necessarily know about that tech. And so at the end of the presentations, we have question and answer, and then we put it to a vote. We let the community vote about which technology they want to see implemented in our ongoing demo. And we've turned that into a conference talk, too, with live voting. That's very fun. So if you're interested in all this security stuff and all these security system design choices that you choose show, especially right now since we're doing all the security projects, is a good place to be. And that's, that's what keeps me busy, more or less. So thank you so much, everyone. It's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you.